Hi, I'm Giles Martin. I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2. I was actually born in 1969 um, on John Lennon's birthday, which fascinated him. Um, he said to my dad, no, you're not sort of arsehole he's going to turn out to be. Um, it's funny, growing up as a kid, having a father like George Martin, you can't compare it to anything else. I've never actually swapped dads with anyone. Um, but we didn't necessarily, myself and my sister didn't actually grow up in a in a, in a terribly musical house, apart from, as a kid, I noticed my dad played the piano a lot, and odd people would come back and forth. In fact, when I was a playgroup, my, um, they went around the class, and I was about four or five, and they said, you know, what do your parents do for a living? And they, you know, you know, my dad's an accountant, my dad's a lawyer, my dad's a truck driver, whatever. And I said, my dad just sits at home and plays the piano. And it turns out he was writing, I think he was writing the music for Live and Let Die, the film at the time. And there's huge embarrassment amongst my parents. They go, you know, he's not employed, you know, he's got a proper job. And so it wasn't a sort of thing. I think that, I think growing up in, in, a, in a, it was, I didn't necessarily grow up in a musical household. It wasn't, you know, I had the privilege of meeting people like Paul McCartney at an early age and, and, and meeting, you know, the Beatles at an early age, but they were just friends of my parents. It didn't mean a whole lot to me as a kid. Um, I remember when I became interested in the guitar and became interested in songwriting, Paul did say to me, he was incredibly encouraging, he goes, that's great, you know, I find it difficult to write songs and I'm Paul McCartney. So I did have a privileged sort of background as far as that goes. My parents were always uh, very wary of me getting a proper job. They, I learned to play the guitar, as you can, some people might be able to see quite badly, but behind my parents' back, you know, it was a, it was a thing, you know, don't join the music industry. Um, I'm delighted I did. In fact, I really got involved in music because my dad started to lose his hearing when I was about 16 and he needed a second pair of ears and he didn't really want to tell people he was losing his hearing. So I became his ears to a certain extent. I'd come in and try and help him by through that I would learn off him. And we started working together. And it was actually a great thing because I was needed to a certain extent by him, which is nice as a son and a father working together. And at the same time, he was always very good. He never had a sort of, that's my boy kind of attitude. He was always very uh, receptive to my ideas. And in fact, he's been receptive to people's ideas throughout the whole of his career. And uh, he treated me no differently and was always open to, to my suggestions, however wrong they may be. And you know, God knows I made lots of wrong ones. So it gave me a chance to learn, it gave me a chance to respect him for what he does and what he's done. I, I never thought of, I was never any good um, at learning songs off by heart. I mean, you know, I bluff my way through most things. I've never been terribly accurate at playing anything. I can play a number of things very badly, but I was much more interested in playing for a reason. So as soon as I learned to play the guitar with a friend of mine, we started playing in the underground here, started playing in tube stations and playing whatever songs we could learn, basically, you know, as you do. And my parents were, my dad was especially distraught by this. He didn't want, you know, George Martin's son being arrested because it's illegal. At that stage, it was illegal to busk. In fact, the way we played it should have been illegal, but it was illegal to busk. And uh, I then got into playing bands. I formed a band, you know, as you do. And I had a great time, I think, playing in a band, learning to play an instrument. Learning to play a guitar was the best thing I ever did. And not that I practice the guitar or play it very often now, but it opens so many doors as far as if you're willing to play it to people, if you're willing to bore people with it. It's great, you know, to meet people and chat. It's like a, a great hobby to have. It's better than video games, for instance. And, and I think that being in a band taught me more about recording and music for enough than being the son of George Martin did. Because people, if you're the son of um, someone, people expect you have this knowledge, which generally you don't have. You know, people think you grew up in recording studios. And of course, I'd spent more time in studios than probably people, other people are 16, but it's still just a row of buttons. You know, if you're 16, it's still just, you know, a compressor, of course, I know what a compressor does. I hadn't got a clue for a long time because people expect you to know these things. But if you're in a band, you, especially as I was in an unsuccessful band, you have a chance to make a whole lot of mistakes and learn stuff. And the hardest thing, not that it's a bad thing, but the hardest thing if you're a son of some son of some famous or a child of a famous person is you don't get that many chance, chances to make mistakes before people go, people are hoping for the second coming, people are going, he's going to be just like his dad. And if you screw up, you're then the other way. You're then, he couldn't get a proper job. 
And so being in a sort of hidden band gave me a chance to learn. And that's what, you know, music is about evolving. It's about discovering new stuff. It's about learning new songs. It's about learning how things work. It's not about playing the same old things every day. Then things become boring. After playing in a band, I carried on playing in, I always played in, played with people, always like going on tour and playing in pubs and clubs. So I thought, thought, you know, it's just, it was just great fun. And I started writing jingles, I started writing commercials. Um, I started doing gasoline adverts, that was my, for, for France. French gasoline is, was the peak of my life. And that was when I was at university. And then when I left university, I wanted to become a record producer. I wanted to write music people and produce people, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any, you know, what do you do? You can't go, I'm the son of George Martin, let me produce you, you know, it's, or, or give me a job. And so I ended up working in press. And at the same time, I started looking at bands. And funny enough, my dad was sort of, he was nervous, I think, of me following in his footsteps at this stage. And I saw a band called My Life Story. They're playing at the, 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 My Life Story, they're playing at the, the Astoria in London. And I went to go see them play and I thought they were good and they were, had a whole lot of strings and I did an arrangement of them and produced them. And they released a single that became sort of number one in Melody Maker and Enemy and the Cool magazines. And someone showed it to my dad and said, look what your son's been up to. And I was just doing it in the evenings, you know, as you do if you're a fan of music and you want to get into music. And that kind of opened doors to me. I left the press job and became a producer. Pro production engineering is, is something that you learn stuff all the time with, like any sort of, sort of music. I mean, I think, for me, starting out and how I am now, if I can work in any form of music, I'm happy. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, I think um, I produce more stuff now and remix and mix stuff now, probably because in a way it's what people expect of me and maybe I'm okay at it. The Love Project came from, it came from the fact that they needed to do a show. It was uh, George Harrison and Guy Le Liberté, who's the head of Cirque du Soleil, were friends. And they decided to do a show and they decided they couldn't have anyone singing Beatles songs a la Mamma Mia. They didn't want, you know, a chorus singing Hey Jude on stage. And I think that's the right decision. And so they approached my dad and I just had quite a lot of success in the UK doing classical stuff at the time. And Apple came to see me and I sat with my dad and talked to them about it. And I said to them, I could try doing, creating a gig that never happened. And Neil Aspinall, who was the head of Apple, said, you know, I'd love, you know, till we talked about, because he was their roadie, we talked about their shows. We talked about, you know, starting off with Long Tall Sally and finishing with Twist and Shout, or, you know, creating this thing. And I said, well, listen, with Pro Tools and digital stuff, I can perhaps create a gig that never happened. So under complete secrecy, uh, I went upstairs here into a very small room and took some material and I took the beginning, the, sorry, the, the drums from the end and get back because I realized they're the same tempo and because I thought I'd start a gig, never happened with a drum solo going into a song and started moving things around and you know, people said mashing up, I always thought it was a bit rude um, and then thought how am I going to start this and got the piano from a day in the life and turned that backwards because I thought if that makes a good ending it'll make a good beginning as it sucks into the chord from Hard Day's Night. I just had fun, you know, and my view was, you know, if I can impress my dad doing Beatles stuff then that's pretty good, you know, as a son you're always trying to impress your dad I think or, or compete in some way and it just so happened that it was on Beatles stuff and I was auditioning for the Beatles and I really thought that they probably wouldn't like it. You know, I, I really thought that people would think this is a really bad idea. It sounds like a bad idea if you just talk about it. And I then took Within You, Without You and Tomorrow Never Knows and stuck those together because I thought this will definitely get me fired, if nothing else. And they came and they really liked it. They liked the ideas. And so I ended up becoming um, the sort of... <laughs> you know, the sort of legacy which I kind of fought against for a long time, and here I am now in Abbey Road talking about it, um, suddenly became part of it. And uh, I backed up all the catalogue and the Pro Tools and started working on this, on this project, which, which became love. Um, I came with my dog Stan and went to my room and started working, you know, we had a list. I worked with the director of the show and my dad. My dad would come in sort of two days a week and I'd play him ideas and we'd work through stuff. So he was kind of producing me doing it. But the bosses were 
the Beatles, Ringo and Paul, and Olivia, Olivia Harrison and Yoko Ono, who were representing George and John. And it was important that they liked everything. They had to hear everything before it was passed on anywhere, anywhere else. And the interesting thing about the Beatles, it's such a protected circle, rightfully so, that if you do something and no one likes it, no one ever hears it. You know, and that's actually quite a good thing for me because it means I could take risks. You know, occasionally people at Abbey Road were sort of, you know, people who never hadn't heard anything, which the majority of people here didn't like the idea of what we were doing and didn't like the idea of me coming in and changing. People think it's changing history, but it's not because I'm not deleting anything. I wasn't, you know, I, I was just really trying to do something different. And Ringo and Paul would come in. The funny thing is they come and listen to stuff and they're not allowed to take stuff away either. It's not like you give them a CD. The only chance of them listening to the new mixes we were doing was by coming here and listening to them. And then later as we got the technology sorted out and secure drives were done, I would go and see Yoko and sit down with her and work through stuff. And it's fascinating. For me it was fascinating because I have no past with them. You know, I have no, I certainly wasn't there at the time. And so it's kind of on an even, I'm, I'm, I'm way down the pecking order, but it's kind of, I mean, on an even keel, as it were. There's no history, I have no, you know, experience of anything they did. So it was quite easy for me just to go, do you like it or you don't, what, you don't, what don't you like about it? And they were very proactive in it, um, all four of them, you know, the two wives and Ringo and Paul. And, you know, Paul was, Paul was the one that would give me the fear because he's such a good musician. I mean, Ringo is a pretty good musician as well, and they'd, they'd you know, they know their stuff and they know their own material and uh, occasionally in fact when we were doing the show I sat down with Paul I went through each bit and you know played in bits in the theatre and it was great it was a great evening and he goes you know he said to me you know I just I really I, I have to say I really like what you've done and you, what you've done has been sympathetic with my music and I really appreciate that for me that was just you know the best but when, we, when the show, when it came to the opening of the show, at the very beginning when people walk into the theatre and they're sitting down, I couldn't work out what, because they wanted Beatles music to play, and someone said, well, why don't you just do another 60 minutes of, and I mean, it took me two years to do the 90 minutes. So I decided to get as many Beatles on as I could by taking the vocals off, which is difficult with Beatles stuff, because there's so much leakage on the tracks, and just play the backing tracks. So it's like the Beatles are playing, they're backing as you walk in. So you have Dear Prudence with no vocal, you know, you have Should Know Better with no vocal, and Penny Lane with no vocal. And the idea was that it would counterpoint because when because starts, it's just vocals. So I'm sitting with Paul, and he's two, my dad's there, and Paul's there, and Penny Lane's playing in the in the ceiling of the theatre. And Paul goes, and what's this then? And I went, It's Penny Lane. He goes, I know it's bloody Penny Lane, but what is what's it doing in the ceiling? And I said, well, I just thought it would be an idea to, you know, because they listened to everything. I thought it would be an idea to maybe put the backing tracks up there. And he's like, oh, OK, you know, I'll have a listen. And it's right there because it is their music. And, you know, and my dad sometimes, you know, it's, he feels embarrassed because it's, it's not his music and it certainly isn't mine. It is there. It's, they were, there were four Beatles and it was their band and that was it. There's no fifth Beatle. With music, there's things you'd like to do. I, I wish I could play things better, you know. I've always thought, you know, it'd be great to, to really learn how to play the bass properly, or guitar properly, or piano properly, you know. Um, but uh, it's just a question of time. Maybe I'll start watching our video tunes and, and then become a better musician. But, you, you know, there's, I'd like to, you know, work with you know, a really good young band. At the same time, I'd love to go and do something like the Love Project with something else, you know, with taking, taking stuff and creating, make people listen to music again. The good thing about Love is it does, people do analyse and people do listen, and people don't have it on the background, they do actually get into it. And that's why we do music, we do music because we're passionate about it. And so, really, I mean, I, I'm about to write a television thing, I'm, you know, you just, it's a question of writing, producing and being creative and anything that lets you do that, you take. And every day, I just can't believe I, I can do this for a living. You know, I was told by my parents for years it's an impossible job to do for a living, despite coming from my background, because I think maybe when I have kids, I'll be doing the same thing, you know, don't go into music, you know. But it's just, it's, you do it because you love it. And, that's, and, and if you can get paid for it, it means you don't have to do another job to get in the way as well, so it's fantastic. I would say to anyone learning an instrument, anyone you know, struggling, because let's face it, we all struggle with instruments all the time, and we struggle with music. 
is that no matter how hard it is, it's hard for everyone. And that love that you have for it, never let go of it. Because you, know, you might be trying to learn a song and go, I'm never going to learn this. But the fact of it is, you do. You do learn and you do move on. And the thing to do is never ever give up. Never ever lose that drive and that, that feeling you get when you work something out or you hear some great music. Because it's much better than sitting down and watching the telly. I mean, the thing about, the thing about music is that I think if anyone's toured, I used to tour a lot, you know, you end up kind of working on automa automatic pilot. And, uh, and you get, you start amusing yourself with stuff. I was playing bass in a band, and you start playing the same things over and over again. And, and uh, I was once in Germany, and I used to jump off the stage. And, and I jumped off the stage, and I had no idea until I left the theater, how far I was jumping. We played the end of the concert, and I jumped off the stage, and there was no crowd there. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't that popular, but there was, there was a break before the people. And I launched off the stage, and seeing the band's faces, and they looked at me, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die in a, in a shit club in Germany. And I dropped about 12 feet. My bass amp almost followed me, because I you know, didn't have wireless or anything. I just, the bass, <laughs> it was like Wile E. Coyote. The, my lead unraveled. <laughs> it's the only thing that kept me alive. And an MPEG SV200 over there called, came, came crashing out afterwards. But yeah, I spent most of my time being laughed at by people. You know, I think it's important. I think it's important in studios to have a good laugh. It's funny, I mean, you know, it's, you know, the Beatles. It's one thing, that, one thing that was shocking for me from listening to all of the tapes, everything they did, was not you know, how serious it was. It was how much kind of fun there is in the tapes, even when you think, oh, the White Album, they didn't get on. They're really cracking up most of the time. And it's kind of, you forget that actually they came to the studio to have a good time. And all the other stuff you read about happened in offices and accountants and all that sort of stuff. Most of the studio stuff is great. And that's the thing about music. Music should be fun. You know, if you're learning music, have a laugh with it. And don't sit on your own and do it. You know, find someone to play with. Because, uh, the great thing about music is there's always someone worse than you. you can, I mean, in my case, you really have to hunt them out. But, you know, there is. And so show off to someone. Well, the, I mean, the great thing about the internet is the fact you can, you can delve into the world of songs and work out chords. And one of the problems I struggle from is you look on the internet, and quite often the, the chord sheets are wrong. There's some guy going, if you know the right way this song goes, please write in. You think, oh, that's no good. I can work that out. And the great thing about iVideo tunes is it breaks down that barrier and you've suddenly been taught by professionals. You've suddenly been taught in a simple way by professionals. It's kind of inspired me. You know, I saw iVideo tunes before, before I got involved in it. And it's inspired me to like going, right, I'm going to see if I can learn the piano better now. You know, and I think that's a great thing. You know, People don't have access to the best people in the world. And now, with iVideo tunes, they do. You can be taught by some of the best people, you know, from home. And the way it's shot and the way it's done is very simple. You know, if I can understand it, it's very simple. So I think it's a great thing. It's a great learning tool for people. And, uh, and I think hopefully it'll, be, it'll create great musicians in the future. My name's Giles Martin, I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2 talking about the Beatles' Michelle. Michelle was recorded on the 3rd of November 1965, um, mainly by Paul in the room working bits out on the acoustic guitar. He kind of, he kind of wanted a sort of, you know, he said at one stage he wanted a, a sophisticated song to be played, you know, at parties and things like that. And it's kind of become a, a sort of folk musician's piece, Michelle, in a funny way. It's based around his guitar playing. It's very distinctive, a descending line in F minor. But his, what you can hear when the, when, the, when the song actually starts the guitar and the drums is really his heavy thumb bass notes and the acoustic guitar. A lot like, say, for instance, Yesterday, almost the same kind of playing. You know, he's, he does strums with his fingers and plays with his thumb. And it's distinctive of Paul McCartney. And apart from the drums, 
it's reported that maybe Paul played everything on this track. You know, I think they did drums and guitar first, and then there's, then there's a bass part with another guitar, and there's lead guitar on it, top. What's distinctive really about this, which makes it very Beatles, is the, is the, is the vocal harmonies, the three-part harmonies you hear, which are very sort of smooth in a way, and soloed on their own as you, as you can on the four track. They're really, you know, are almost perfect. They sound like, it's when the Beatles had this thing with their voices that the three voices complement each other so well that it sounds like more voices. I was trying to think, well, it must be double tracked. This must be double tracked because it sounds so smooth in a way. I mean, same way that because later on sounds like a choir, you know, it's just three of them, and be double tracked. But the Beatles did this, and Michelle's a case in point of this. Uh, there was concerns at one stage whether the lad should sing in French. My dad had a concern about it, I think. But you know, it works, and it's kind of quaint in a way. Michelle was actually going to be a single um, for a bit, and John Lennon sort of quashed the idea. He hated the idea of Michelle being a single because it wasn't really Beatles for him. It was a bit soft and a bit kind of what Paul intended, a bit kind of barham in a way. And, but funny enough, in 66, February 66, the, a band called The Overlanders in the UK had a number one hit with it for three weeks. So maybe, maybe Paul was right after all. Michel shows Paul, you know, his imagination, his writing on an acoustic guitar. The introduction is, starts off with a descending F minor. It's, it's, uh, it shows how far he'd come on from, say, Love Me Do two years before. Just descending down to a B flat minor nine, to a C major. And the Beatles were always very careful about their introductions. They always made them as musical as possible, and this is no exception. The tone for the electric guitar in Michelle is very simple. It's very warm, and uh, you're really getting a jazz guitar kind of sound. And uh, the most important element of that is using the neck pickup on the guitar rather than a bridge or a combination of the bridge and neck. So definitely switch to the neck pickup and roll the tone down on your guitar as well if you have a tone knob. I've even got the bass cranked up on the amp, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> So it's just a matter of really getting the treble rolled out of the sound, making sure that the, it's clean enough that it's not uh, distorting at all. And you're just going for sort of an old time jazz guitar kind of sound. And that's the electric guitar tone from Michelle. Michelle by the Beatles. This song is in the key of F in standard tuning, and the acoustic guitar plays the intro, which is four measures long. I'm going to play it in time and then explain it. So it starts with a little F minor chord in the eighth position. Uh, my third finger is on the tenth fret of the third string, my second finger is on the ninth fret of the second string, and my first finger is on the eighth fret of the first string. So you're just going to play the third string, open, and then pick the first and second string for an F minor chord. And the idea here is that the note on the third string is just going to descend in half steps. And you're basically doing the same thing for the first, for the first couple measures here. It's going to go F minor, and then this is going to be an F minor major 7. And then bringing that note back to the 8th fret on the third string that becomes F minor 7. So again, that's F minor, F minor major 7, F mi minor 7, and then bringing the first finger back one additional fret, that's F minor 6. So... And then the first finger is going to slide back to the 6th fret on the 3rd string, and then you're going to strum the 1st and 2nd strings. This time I have the third finger on the eighth fret of the first string and my first finger is barred across the sixth fret for strings two and three. So that chord is a B flat minor uh, nine chord actually. And there's an F in the bass, which we're not playing. So technically that'd be a B flat minor nine over F. And there's a little melody on the first string here. 
where I'm lifting the 8th fret, then playing the 6th fret of the 1st string, down to the 9th fret of the 2nd string. So. And after that, you're going to slide into basically a C uh, with no 3rd in it. I'm actually muting the 3rd string. So this is sort of like a little F chord shape. Uh, if you're familiar with the F chord in open position, or in 1st position, we're up at the 8th fret. So this is actually a C major chord. Um, but in fact, I'm just going to mute the third string, so I'm sliding from a half step below it. And just picking the top two strings, then the fourth string. So you get so the top two strings twice, and then the fourth string, then the top two strings, and then back to the four strings again. So the whole thing again will sound like this. And that's the acoustic guitar intro for Michelle. For the verse, you're actually playing a six measure chord progression, and in some cases, you're going to play it twice for 12 measures. And it starts with an F major chord in fifth position. And for this, I'm actually borrowing the first finger across the top three strings strings one, two, and three. My second finger is on the 6th fret of the 2nd string, my 3rd finger is on the 7th fret of the 4th string, and my 4th finger is on the 8th fret of the 1st string. So you just want that kind of strumming pattern, it's sort of a lazy strumming pattern. One, two, three, four. This is down, down, up, down, up, down. And you can think of that as a basis, you don't have to do that through the entire thing, you can change it up a little bit. But you want to have a little bit of that swing to it. Okay, so that's F major for the first measure, and then it's going to go to B flat minor seven. Um, this is actually right now a B flat minor chord. I've got my my um, third finger on the eighth fret of the fourth string. My first finger is barring uh, the sixth fret on strings two and three, and my fourth finger is at the ninth fret of the first string. So, and there's the seventh that uh, gets added by moving the fourth finger to the second string of the ninth fret. So. And the next chord is going to be E flat 6. You can do that simply by just fretting the top four strings with the first finger. Or if you prefer, you could play a standard bar chord E flat there. That wouldn't make that big of a difference. But e flat 6. The next chord is going to be a D diminished chord. So this is a less common chord. My uh, first finger is on the sixth fret of the fourth string, my third finger's on the seventh fret of the third string, and my second finger's on the sixth fret of the second string. The idea with this measure is you're going to slide this up in minor thirds, the whole shape, just strumming strings two, three, and four. So you get one, two, three, four. So a minor third means three frets. I'm moving from the sixth fret to the ninth fret to the twelfth fret and back to the ninth fret. It's essentially just a D diminished chord. And the, one, the chord after that is going to be C major, which is just a straightforward C major bar chord. My first finger is barring across the 8th fret, all six strings. My second finger is on the ninth fret of the 3rd string, third finger is on the 10th fret of the 5th string, and the fourth finger is on the 10th fret of the 4th string. So it's, and then moving to uh, the shape that we just called a D diminished chord a second ago. Now with the G in the bass, it's actually going to be a G7 flat 9. So it goes... And that is just exactly the same chord we had when we were doing D diminished. We moved it up to the ninth fret. So. And again, because the bass note changes, technically that's a G7 flat 9. So again, here's the whole verse. And that's the acoustic guitar verse for Michelle. play the chorus in time and then explain it slowly. So 
So that's a six measure progression. And what's interesting is it starts on F minor. Uh, and previously in the song we've had F major. That's something that the Beatles did often, was a switch between the major and minor tonality of whatever key the song was in. And um, the first finger for this chord is just barring across the eighth fret, strings one through five, and I have the sixth string muted. The second finger is on the ninth fret of the second string, the third finger is on the tenth fret of the fourth string, and the fourth finger is on the tenth fret of the third string. So that's, again, F minor for two measures. Down to A flat, dominant seven, in the fourth position. So this is the first finger just barring across the entire fourth fret. The second finger is on the fifth fret of the third string. The third finger is on the sixth fret of the fifth string, and the fourth finger is on the seventh fret of the second string. So that's A flat, dominant seven. And this is a little bit of a tricky chord, especially on acoustic guitar. If you lift the fourth finger off, you may find that a lot easier. It's still an A flat, dominant seven but it sounds a little more official to have that uh, G flat on there on the seventh fret of the second string. In the next measure, just move up to D flat major. So that chord is uh, just a basic major chord, and I've got my first finger barred across the ninth fret, all six strings. The second finger is on the tenth fret of the third string, the third finger is on the eleventh fret of the fifth string, and the fourth finger is on the eleventh fret of the fourth string. And then sliding back one fret, to a C7 chord. So I'm just taking that D flat major chord that we had, just moving it back one fret and lifting the fourth finger out of that, which changes it into a dominant seven chord. So by lifting that fourth finger out of the basic major chord shape, the chord becomes a dominant seven. And that is exactly what we have here. That's a C dominant seven chord for that last measure. And then back to F minor for that very last measure. And that's the acoustic guitar chorus for Michelle. electric guitar solo comes in both in the middle of the song and it repeats and fades on the outro. I'm going to play it in time and then explain it slowly. So it starts with uh, walk up right up the F major scale, starting from the 8th to the 10th. So 8, 8, 10 on the 5th string to the 7th fret of the 4th string. And then the 8th to the 10th to the 11th fret on the 4th string, down to the 6th fret on the 4th string. So again, that's... And then from the 5th fret to the 6th and 8th fret on the 4th string, and down to the 6th fret of the 5th string to the 8th fret on the 5th string, to the 5th and 6th fret on the 4th string, to the 5th fret on the 5th string, to the 7th fret on the 5th string. So we get... And then the 5th fret on the 5th string, to the 6th fret on the 4th, to the 8th fret on the 5th string, down to the 7th fret on the 5th string. And the last phrase is right up the... You can think of it as being uh, right up the C major scale. C at the 8th fret of the 6th string to the 10th fret of the 6th string, and then the 7th, 8th, and 10th fret on the 5th string. And the very last note, being the, uh, the F on the 8th fret of the 5th string, is only played during the repeat on the outro. When you actually play the solo in the middle, you're going to climb up to that 11th fret, the A flat there, as, the, as it goes into the F minor that starts the chorus. So the end of the middle guitar solo and the end of the repeat at the outro. And that would start it back up again to repeat. And that's the guitar solo for Michelle. This is the acoustic performance of Michelle.
understand.